Okay, I might just continue a similar theme, actually. Who's been to Myanmar in the audience here? Very few hands. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Myanmar, and, and like Jessica, I'm going to hopefully show you a few postcards. Um, I spent the last two years in Myanmar, and I'd have to say it's been fascinating actually being in the country as it's gone through probably two of the most fundamental years of change uh, as it's moving towards democracy, uh, the famous Aung San, Aung San Suu Kyi being elected as uh, state councillor, not president, but, uh, but still its development, uh, but lots of change. Um, one of the things I'll tell you about Myanmar, though, which is interesting, is that before the Second World War, Myanmar was the wealthiest country in ASEAN. <clears throat> and today, it's actually the poorest. So Myanmar's got a long way to go. Um, as well as being the wealthiest country in Asia, it was the rice bowl of Asia. So Myanmar was a net exporter of rice, uh, and yet today, uh, that's pretty much the way rice is tilled in Myanmar. It's all by hand, there's very little mechanisation, uh, and really what they produce, they use to feed the, uh, feed the country. Myanmar was a major source of oil for the region. And uh, once again, this is the way the oil industry works today. There is some oil pumped uh, in more traditional ways, but a lot of it's actually pumped in villages with these sort of uh, handmade stills. Uh, Myanmar was a transport hub. So I'm not sure if many people know this, but the original London to Sydney route for uh, air tra travel went through Rangoon. <clears throat> uh, so Bangkok really wasn't a, uh, was it wasn't a stop on those routes. Um, and lastly, and probably most interestingly for us here, Myanmar was really the, the financial hub for Southeast Asia. Um, so this building here is a fascinating building. It's actually on the Strand uh, in Yangon. Uh, it's the Bank of Bombay building that was built in the late 1800s, which became the Imperial Bank of India, uh, and then went on to become the State Bank of India today. So you may ask, right, what actually happened uh, if Myanmar went from being the richest country before the Second World War to the poorest uh, today? Well, there were a number of things. Firstly, the Second World War was actually very bad for Myanmar. So the Japanese invaded, they fought all the way up to the Indian border, and then the British fought back and fought all the way back through to the, uh, to the Thai border. And that pretty much destroyed uh, Myanmar over twice. But really, the, uh, the rot really set in to a certain extent when this gentleman on the left actually became the leader of the country in 1962. So he launched a coup in 1962. So his name's General Ne Win. Um, and he pretty much, from that point on, went about fundamentally, fundamentally destroying the economy in Myanmar and really starting with the financial sector. So he nationalised the banks in 1962. So that included banks like HSBC, Standard Chartered, uh, State Bank of India, uh, and all these other banks. Um, he's also, I mean, there's been some talk of demonetisation today. He also demonetised three times, 1964, 1985, and 1987. And the reason I, I raise the demonetisation is, and to show you sort of the way this particular gentleman thought, if you look at the notes on the right-hand side, you'll see there's some very unusual denominations, uh, 15, 90, 35. He was basically told by his astrologer that uh, numbers like 50 and 100 were bad luck for the country, so he wiped out the savings of the entire country and introduced notes like 35 chats and 65 chats and so on. So the astrologer told him five was a good denominator. So <clears throat> certainly uh, Myanmar's got a long way to go. But the impact of all this and the impact really of 50 years of, uh, of underinvestment has really led to the Myanmar people uh, completely not trusting the banking sector. Uh, it would be fair to say there's almost zero trust in the banking sector in the country. So when we look at the bank population in the country, it's extremely low. And, and one of my themes today, I, when I talk about the fintech industry, it's an extremely nascent fintech industry. So we just talked, we've just looked at Israel, we've just looked at India, Myanmar is extremely low. So really only about 6% of the population is banked. Um, we say that at 49% actually access no service. Quite a few people in Myanmar actually use banks to do remittances, and that's why you see a 24% there. But really, 6% of the population is, is, uh, is banked. Um, in terms of branch penetration, it's extremely low. So uh, basically, branch penetration is on par with South Sudan, Afghanistan, and Haiti. So clearly these are three countries that don't really uh, rate high in the development stakes. And really the interesting thing I find about this slide is that if you look at the branch penetration of say Thailand to Myanmar, so 12.2 branches per 100,000 people versus 3.1, for Myanmar to get to the same stage as Thailand would require more than three to 4,000 branches to be built. And in my view, that's just not going to happen, right? We're never gonna see that sort of branch penetration happen in the country. 
So uh, before I just talk about wave money quickly, so from a regulatory perspective, there's been a lot of change in the country. So there was a financial institution law passed this year that's really revolutionised the way the banking sector is actually regulated. As part of that, there was also a mobile financial services regulation passed. Uh, and Wave Money, the company that I run, uh, was the first licensee under that regulation. So we're, we're a mobile money play, so we really are looking to transfer money around the country uh, and also to allow people to have a, a digital wallet where they can store, uh, store safely and send very safely. So eventually we'll move into products like savings. We want also want to move into lending products. We'll move into insurance products uh, and, uh, and, and really start to get a little bit more sophisticated as time goes on. We've got about 5,000 wave shops, so <clears throat> there's very little ATM infrastructure in the country, very little POS infrastructure. Uh, so we, we, we're rolling out basically our own cash in, cash out shops. Uh, and currently we're sitting at about 250,000 customers after about five months in market. So I'm just going to show you a very short video. It only goes for about a minute. I'm going to cut it off uh, halfway. Uh, and it'll just show you a little bit about what our customers, or how our customers interact with our service. <laughs> ဒီမဲ့ဒါကိုအင်းကိုမြင်လဲစိတ်ရှိရင်အဲ့ဒါကျွန်တော်လူမှန်းကိုညွတ်ချက်လိုက်တာပါဒီဝေမန်းနီအ
So uh, da uh, Rob actually asked me, what does the market look like in, uh, in 2020? Uh, I would say that there are really three things we're going to see in Myanmar in 2020. Firstly, we're going to have a very vibrant and competitive fintech industry. So we're, we've actually launched as the first licensee. Uh, the other mobile operators in market will launch, and there's another couple of players who are also in the market. Um, I see the digital startup industry starting to mature. As I said, the fintech industry is extremely nascent in the country, but we are start, starting to see some of these startups, Easy Stay is an Airbnb type play. Uh, the pink um, logo below, Cargo, is, a, uh, is an aggregator of, uh, of, uh, of trucks around Yangon. So these are digital startups that are actually starting to develop. And most importantly, on the right-hand side, uh, we really see that uh, customers will be digitally connected. We don't see the need for bank branches. We very strongly believe that banking will be disrupted in the country uh, and that by 2020, people will really be using uh, their mobile to do all their financial services. Um, very quick 10 minutes. If you'd like to know more about Wave Money, I'm here for the next couple of days. Uh, or please uh, jump on our Facebook site or, or take a look at our website. Thanks very much.